Hello, my name is Tom Barker. I'm the author of the book Quality by Experimental Design, which is in its third edition. I retired from teaching after 35 years at the Rochester Institute of Technology and have the title Professor Emeritus. Before RIT, I spent 21 years at Xerox as an engineer and utilized statistical experimental design extensively in over 2,000 projects during the early development of the xerographic process. What I want to do with these introductory vignettes on statistical experimental design is to introduce you to the power of these methods that link the three essential elements of bringing a product to the marketplace, engineering, management, and statistics. By managing the engineering activity with the power of statistical thinking, not only do you have the ability to create a system to commercialize the product, you do so in the most cost-effective manner possible and guarantee the quality of that product all at the same time. Let's begin by looking at the philosophical reasons behind using statistical experimental design. I've brought my monk friends along since they are such great philosophers. My monk friend asks, why design experiments? I'm sure you have your own personal reasons. But here are four reasons I have found to be both universal and extremely important. First, we design experiments because this method gives us a structured plan of attack on the opportunity before us. Second, because these are statistical experimental designs, we can easily mesh proven statistical analysis methods to determine the most likely outcomes. Third, statistical experimental designs are inherently more efficient now, I'll go into excruciating detail on this point since it is central to the management and success of experiments. And fourth, because we have a structured plan of attack, we are forced to get organized in our experimentation. The greatest reason for failure in experimentation is lack of organization. There is an entire vignette devoted to this topic where you will learn how to organize. Here is the definition of efficiency. An efficient experiment gets the required information at the least expenditure of resources. This is an exact definition and has three elements of an efficient experiment. The first is experiment. There's a big difference between a test and an experiment. Second, we get the required information. Not too much, not too little, just right. And finally, we get this information at the least resources. The key elements then are experiment, required, and resources. Let's look at the difference between a test and an experiment. Testing is an endeavor to see if something works. Now, my monk friend has devised a Dead Sea Scroll translation device that does not seem to be working. Why, of course, it's not plugged in. So, a monk who is a member of the electrical union comes and connects it to the mains, the knife switch is thrown and... Poof! The whole thing blows up. Have you ever experienced a proof test? The problem is there is usually nothing left to analyze why it poofed. Experimentation, on the other hand, links the ifs of testing to determine why. Why is the most important question you can ask. As you will see, an experiment is a structured set of coherent tests that are analyzed as a whole to gain understanding of the process. This is how experimentation differs from testing, because experimentation is oriented to understanding. Understanding breeds control and leads to lasting success. A successful test may give us an instant gratification today, but may lead to unfortunate surprises tomorrow. An experiment gives us a functional relationship, an equation that leads us to product and process designs that have no surprises. Oh, it looks like my monk friend used an experiment. His translation machine is working. If I have convinced you that you should be experimenting, not merely testing, then let me show you the three elements of a good experiment. You need knowledge of the process, clear goals and objectives, and a response variable. But you say, but I'm experimenting to gain knowledge. Experimental design focuses the prior knowledge you already have 
the things you learned in school, informal on-job training, even small preliminary experiments, or even tests. Then there's the lore of accumulated data. This can be used as a numerical brainstorming to uncover possible factors that need to be studied in a structured manner. Unfortunately, I have seen statisticians waste their time trying to make sense out of messy plant data. Use plant data to uncover likely factors. More than that is usually impossible. It is important to separate the goal, the end result, from the objective, how we get there. In fact, the objective defines the required information. Here's an example of a goal and an objective taken from the photographic chemistry industry. The picture on the left is washed out and not very pleasing. Our goal is to make the image quality better like the picture on the right. The objective, however, defines what we are going to look at in the experiment. We have come up with a set of factors that our prior knowledge says will influence image quality, that's IQ. We want to test the idea, hypothesis is a big word for idea, that IQ is functionally related to the amount of developer, Elon, and hydroquinone, the amount of preservative, sodium sulfite, the amount of alkali to make the developers work, and the amount of inhibitor, the KBR, plus the temperature of the solution and the speed at which the photographic material travels through the solution. Notice the prior knowledge that goes into assembling these factors. For a successful experiment, we need something to measure, a response variable or possibly variables. Such responses need to be quantitative, precise, and meaningful. A quantitative response is so much better than good, better, best. Such words are very uncertain. Numbers are easily understood across continents and countries, and of course, we need the numbers to compute the statistics when we analyze our data. Be sure to standardize these responses and avoid engineering wars that debate how to measure and waste so much time and effort. A precise, repeatable response is essential. Accuracy, or how close the response is to the true value, is important, but not essential. Here's the difference between accuracy and precision. To illustrate, let's go to an archery match in Sherwood Forest. Our first shooter is Friar Tuck. His arrows are all over the place, never hitting the target. He has neither accuracy nor precision. Ellen Adale is next, and his sights are slightly misaligned. He just got a new bow. His cluster is good, but he is not exactly on the bullseye. Of course, Robin Hood strikes the center of the target over and over and over again, splitting his arrows. Robin has both accuracy and precision and a large bill for arrows. If, of course, we could aspire to Robin Hood's accuracy and precision, that would be great for our response. But if we can live up to Alan Adale's precision, we'll do okay in experimental design. The final quality of a good response is that the response is related to the customer requirements. Who is the customer? This is not necessarily the end use customer, but the customer who will get the output of the experiment we are working on, the next in line. To assure this happens, the customer of the experiment must be a part of the experiment and make known the responses needed. This is part of the organization of experimentation. Let's look at the definition of an efficient experiment once again and focus on the final element, resources. What are resources? Money is certainly a resource. It is a renewable resource. We can borrow money or invest it from profits. People are a resource. We can hire new people or redirect people from other projects another renewable resource. But time is something we can neither beg, borrow, nor steal. Time is the most precious of resources. Statistical experimental design conserves all of these resources, especially time.